Hi, everybody. This is James Chai, RFR Bark Bark Rescue Foundation, registered nonprofit. And today is October 21st, 2019. This is episode 27. So uh, in three more days, it'll be a month that I started doing this. And it'll be 30 episodes. Hopefully, I'll, I'll get to that and um, we'll get it all figured out. So I have, uh, I'm broadcasting from my old computer because I'm still not able to get onto the internet with my phone through Facebook. Apparently, I don't have an internet connection there, even though I'm surfing it all. Wah, wah, wah. Um, you know, if, <laughs> all right. So I'm just going to try to see if I can bring up what I'm talking about. And then that way, um, I can, I can figure out if somebody's got something to talk to me about. Hi, everybody. I hope everyone's doing really well. Really well. It's been raining here in Vancouver for literally, uh, what is this? So almost four days in a row, nonstop, pretty well. So it's not as much fun as we thought it would be with the rain here in Vancouver. Uh, at least it's not snowing. So, I mean, that, that, that's kind of cool. Um, okay, so I've got some key points here that I want to talk about, and I apologize for starting up a bit late. Uh, I was trying to get online, like I said, and just it's uh, apparently really it's not working today. Um, I think I have to restart my modem and all that. How's the weather for everybody else? Good, great, excellent. Okay, cool. I'll have to wait 45 seconds for anyone to let me know, just because that's the thing. Um, so I'm just trying to trying to get back into my my thing here, so I can tell whether or not I have any comments coming up. So that part kind of kind of sucks, actually. Alrighty. Um, okay, so I put some notes down about what I want to talk about today. And uh, I'm not sure which ones, and it's, you know, if, again, if you guys want to say or think about something to talk about, just please let me know and I can talk about that instead. And I'm just going to... Um, Chai, our okay, Rescue right, 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 Foundation, right. registered not just gonna watch down and oh also for sue palmer who i was uh talking about with her dog yesterday um regards to mojo and all that yeah momo sorry momo um so uh, we're gonna make arrangements to get you a couple of bags of cat food that's donated as well as uh, some dog food um for you as well for for momo and uh, i want to say thank you to ivy uh for reaching out and offering to donate some supplies to uh, my foundation my little rescue Appreciate it. I haven't had a chance to respond back. I've been a little bit um, backed up on things, and uh, people know I'm kind of falling far behind sometimes on things like that. So, um, okay. So some of the things to uh, possibly talk about, but I want to I want to kind of go over that one. Uh, the title is "Dogs Afraid of Walking on Bridges and Field of Vision Processing Dogs Don't Blink." Right. Just just bear with me. Dogs don't blink. This is um, William. You see, William just did a bit of a yawn. Hi, William. Okay, so uh, uh, some of the keynote points that I, uh, pre notes that I have here, and for some reason it's all gum, gum, gummed up here. Um, uh, oh boy, this is this is a little bit confusing here. Um, today's Facebook's not really doing very well for me today, and I, I know that. Um, for any of those people um, who are uh, watching, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. The link is in my description, and um, this way it'll just kind of help me. Build up things. I got to sneeze. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, okay. So, um, yeah. So, if you could subscribe to my YouTube channel, uh, share my post, help me get the stuff out. Today, I was out on a, um, I spent some time on a, one of the dog training uh, sites. And uh, it's just incredibly how uh, brutal some of these people are. Um, they don't they don't even care to find out about things. And then instead, they just rather just criticize and watch the world burn. And it's like, well, if you love dogs and you want to save them, and that's your profession. Why are you attacking somebody who is techniques you don't understand or, 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 you know, perspective that you don't understand and then, you know, start swearing at them, which is what this one person did. Uh, uh, you know, it's a typical day in the life of uh, James here getting trolled and all stuff. Interestingly enough, that person yesterday uh, who I read out the 13 points uh, to her, the science editor, she hasn't responded since and I'm not going to respond to her because um, I'm gonna wait till she says something. If she does, and I'm just gonna point her to the uh, the vlog that I just did, and let her know that um, just uh, being being uh, being a, a troll and being a bit of a goofball is not really cool. It's just you know, anyways. All right, so I'm just trying to kind of clean this all up here. Uh, for some reason, again, like I say, is um, Facebook just blended this all in today for some odd reason, and. Uh, did you hear what uh, actually Mark Zuckerberg said? Uh, anybody following the news? Uh, apparently, he, he told the press 
that he's not going to censor any political statements whatsoever um, in regards to you know any of the Democratic or uh, GOP parties. He's going to let uh, the politicians say what they want, and which is kind of odd because um, you know that's a bit of a self-serving aspect and a, a, a suppression of uh, free speech. In the, no, not necessarily suppression. Uh, no, I'm sorry, not suppression of free speech. It's a perversion of free speech in, in that um, aspect of uh, allowing un truth to exist and to um yeah yeah sammy it's it's pretty sad okay lincoln stop that's lincoln now i didn't gate everybody off and hopefully they're not going to come out here and it's kind of like hey i want attention so uh yesterday i went for like two hours on the thing so i'm hoping that i can i can keep this under two hours this time um okay so uh, okay, cool. Now, now I have it here. So, yeah. So, um, you know, if you haven't subscribed to my YouTube channel, please subscribe. If you've got an opportunity, if you like what I'm talking about, please share my post. And um, okay, so some of the stuff that I, I want to go through over the key, uh, the the pre notes, and then I'll I'll talk about a few other things here. Uh, it's uh, one of the main parts is that I I have had a few people who contact me or who've asked questions of uh, the stuff when I've worked with them. And then they're saying, you know, my dog is not doing this or doing that, et cetera. Um, they, you know, they were good after the session or a few days, et cetera. And now they're not, they're back to what they were doing before. They're starting to do certain other things. Um, the biggest thing I always say to people is don't push your dog, right? Don't push your dog. If they're at a certain place where they are and you see the progress and the progress is always, always uh, improved just let your dog exist in that level of progress right don't push them they're going to plateau eventually but if you push them they won't plateau they're going to fall backwards and it's going to make a point for the dog being uh, there's Mickey now uh, for the dog being predacious to find the weaknesses in your consistency in the human's consistency they're, they're, they're not just a natural aspect right codependency codependency always looks for that part where we kind of give up on things and let the other party get something that they need to satiate their own emotional uh, um, um, issues. And then we kind of give that way, like emotional vampire. So in a way you can think of your dog as someone as a emotional canine vampire in the sense that they're going to look for things that we ourselves are not consistent. And if we're not consistent, just like it is, if you have, if you have employees, I've had employees before in a, in a business that I uh, ran a couple of uh, employees. If I'm not consistent with them, um, then unfortunately they start to look at things if they're not ethical or morally uh, um, um, sound. So it ends up happening and you have to look for that part of it with your dog because they are looking at it at our point of what we're doing, they're processing our actions at one tenth of a second, they're going to see everything that we're doing. And if they see that we're not consistent, same thing like I talked about being on leash, uh, walking the leash properly with the, our dogs, if we're not consistent, Boom, right off the bat. Same thing with spaghetti the leash and wrapping it all over, over your hand and not having uh, the standard, if you have a standard six foot lead, not having the six foot leash always at that same time, uh, same distance because the dog is gonna, your dog is gonna go, well, okay, uh, my leash isn't six feet anymore. Something's going on. Why am I not at six feet anymore? You wanna be able to train your dog so that they understand that there's consistency on our part. Do all the hard work, all the hard work. Don't slack off, don't get lazy. Don't pull back and go, oh, well, you know what, now they're, they're okay, they're doing right. I don't have to try any harder now. You have to be consistent. And especially with the dogs that I'm working with, on my end, the dysfunctional dogs are highly dysfunctional and some are dangerous and predatory. Lincoln, stop. Um, stop. And that they are the dysfunctional. So they're going to have issues. Things are going to happen with them. Just because your dog has made a visible improvement and physical and, and behavioral improvement, you have to stop. You have to realize that if you don't watch what they're doing and paying attention to what they're doing, they're gonna keep doing stuff. So, so you can't be lazy. You can't just drop what you're doing and just not pay attention anymore, right? You, 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 you just gotta stop and just think. And I, I talk about that part is, if you have any issues happening with your dog, go back to square one of what I taught you. Same thing with I'm talking online here, go back to square one. That's it. It, it doesn't hurt you. Doesn't, Lincoln, stop. Uh, um, I gave him a treat, a little snack um, earlier. 
obviously. <clears throat> Lincoln. So if you have an issue, go back to square one. Start with the baby step again. Start from that. And in, in fact, it doesn't matter if it's training with me or if it's training with anybody at all. Pay attention to what your dog is doing. Be vigilant, be consistent, practice, practice, practice. If all else fails and you're having problems, go back to square one. And the problem is as human beings, we're lazy. We're, we're like, oh, okay, well, we've done it. We don't want to do it anymore. Oh, we're, we're done, right? You see the, the aspects of NIMBY, the acronym NIMBY, N-Y-M-B-Y, not in my backyard. It's, if it's not my problem, I don't care. I'm, you know, let someone else deal with it, etc. So the, the biggest part is stay on track with the training. Regardless of what it is with, with anything, obedience training, dysfunctional aspects here through vid dog training, through what I do, stay on track. If anything is having a problem, if there's anything that is having a problem, stop pushing your dog to get past their plateau. Let them get used to that plateau, and then you can move them up forward. It's just like I talked about um, uh, with Melanie with her dog, uh, Duncan. The bulldog, right, is out there having something. Uh, they're at Starbucks, and then he was good for 20 minutes, and all of a sudden he saw another dog, a Roddy, and then he reacted. And he got really upset, and he, then he was off into that part, and, and Melanie was like, well, you know, I feel like we've gone one step forward, two step backwards. But in actual fact, Duncan was able to exist for 20 minutes in a normally reactive environment where, where he would be reacting to dogs and people, and he was fine for 20 minutes. So he, he was good. 20 minutes versus – instant on reaction, this is so much more of a better improvement. So uh, you gotta recognize what you're doing. You gotta recognize if you're pushing your dog too far, too fast. Reset, I've done it myself where I kinda, of, okay, maybe, maybe not. Then I go, okay, you know, I gotta reset. Go back to the basic reset of the hug, the, the reset of the tone of voice, the, the, the basics. If I take uh, one of my dogs out who's not behaving because they're reacting or, or barking or just being a, a jerk, on leash, right, being a, a little goofball, little brat. We walk maybe a block, and it'll take us 20 minutes to walk a block. And then that's it. Then I walk them back home. The, the, the time frame is going to be 20 minutes. The distance is going to be a third of or a fifth of what we would normally walk in that time frame. And they understand that. They understand that we're not walking this far and they're understanding why are we stopping and why are we not going anywhere and why is, you know, uh, why is dad hugging me all this and why is dad talking to me again in the same way that he used to talk to me in the beginning? Oh, wait a minute. Okay. And then they start to pay attention to that and they realize they're being reset and they realize the basic training is coming back again. Don't push your dog to, to you know, they say don't like foster dogs, right? Adopt them out to someone. Uh, and, you know, say, for example, I just saw a post uh, today, actually, before I came online, about somebody who adopted a, a, a shelter. I can't remember what shelter is called. Um, Jacksonville Shelter, something like that. And they adopted out a dog that they had in their shelter. Even though in their post says not good with kids, they adopted out the dog to shelter uh, to a family which had older kids. And then the dog was returned because didn't do well with the kids. Okay, why would the shelter set their own dog up to fail? And then one of the, the thing I said there is uh, so-and-so has been returned again in capital letters, again. And it's like, and then somebody else posted, well, we, you clearly say it in your post not to go out there to, to a family with children, but you just adopted the dog out to a family with children and you're, this dog, just failed again. And then of course, the next time the dog is in a similar situation or another home, he's still like, oh, he's, he's right. It's just like, it just doesn't make sense. All I'm saying is don't push your dog to fail. Don't push your dog past your comfort level. Don't take risks. Don't try to show off how great your dog is doing. The trauma goes on, right? And I say, you know, you, you don't push progress, right? Okay, your dog has been dysfunctional their whole entire life up to the point where we start working. They've been traumatized, right? And when I'm talking without treats, without medication, et cetera, I actually had some guy uh, troll me on one of the dog training sites today. Um, and he's studying for his bachelor's in, in animal ecology. And it's like, try, 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 and he's using some rude language. Um, just, I don't know why. It's just, I guess when you're 12 years old, you must use that. Um, 
And the thing is that I said to him, okay, well then, because you want to troll me, then I'm going to just, I'll do it. And then I said, well, then uh, I want you to come back with your academia with proof that nowhere in the entire canine um, uh, species is food used as a communication tool. And then he kind of went, well, why are you going after me and trying to shove your, your I'm like, no, I'm, no, you want to come after me and start using profane language? Then you go ahead and prove to me, go talk to your professors at your university, not a college, not a, not an accredited college for dog training or whatever, but he's going to university, getting his bachelor's degree. So then go to your professors and ask them, does food exist as a communication tool in the canine? And, and he hasn't responded since. So we'll see. This is just today. He probably won't respond and whatever, you know. But um, uh, just, just when it comes to the dysfunction of the dog, getting back to that part, dog's been, your dog's been dysfunctional to the point where you're contacting me or you're contacting another trainer, whoever it is, your dog is dysfunctional. There's no ifs, ands, or buts because that's why you're looking for someone to help you with your dog. The progress when you work with me, right, because I have 100% progress, success rate right across the board, right? No, I have a zero kill rate. I have a zero medication rate. The thing is that the dog, your dog progresses with my work, with our work together. And I teach you the tools how to deal with it. Like I said, Axel, the, the German Shepherd, right? His family spent the, the simplest stuff that I taught them. They did it themselves. Three months later, the dog went from dangerous to aggressive and downgraded. And then a year later, there's no designation on, my, on him at all with no incidences. So they practiced what I taught them to do. But I told them the same thing is don't push. And one of the things I remember uh, the mom saying is, I'm not going to push. I'm not going to push. And that's the beautiful part about it. She's like, okay, we're just going to take it easy because he's been like this for six years. So she understands. Well, and she also has a little a young a young kid, right? And so so she understands the patience and all that stuff. But I get people here who is, um, uh, oh, Ivy, okay, hang on a sec, Ivy, um, um, and Sammy. So I, I get the I get that right. I get that you you see the progress happening. You're really happy. You're excited. But at the end of the end of the day, one or two days, couple of weeks is not going to change an entire lifetime. Like look at the people who, you know, want, and people would smoke cigarettes and all that, and they smoke a pack a day. Some guys can stop cold turkey because they're willing themselves psychologically not to smoke anymore, and they're fighting it and all this stuff. And then there's other people who go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And most times, the people we know, the majority of people go back and forth, back and forth, off and on, off and on, until they finally wean themselves permanently off. Cigarettes. Um, bad food, garbage, whatever it is, uh, silly things, bad habits, right? They say it takes 21 days to make a habit and or 21 days to change a habit for a human being. Don't push your dog. Don't set them up to fail because just because you see the progress has made a, a, a substantial market change, right? Market, markedly changed in that part. It can't be permanent unless you do the work and you practice and practice and practice. Same if you train a dog how to, how to um, you know, r roll over and play dead. If you don't keep up on your dog with the basic aspect of that training, it will take your dog just a matter of weeks to forget it. You have to keep doing, right? And how did you train them how to do it? You, you, you did, okay, well, I need the, my dog to sit, then to lay, lay flat, lay down, whatever the command is, lay down and then lay on their side and put their legs up, right? You got two, three, four step aspects of training your dog to do a trick. If you don't keep it up, your dog forgets it after a few weeks. The same thing when it comes to the dysfunctions, but the dysfunctions is such a present seated behavior because it's how they, 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 they behave, right? They're, they're out there, they call out the door, your, your dog is like worried and afraid of, of being attacked by other dogs, right? For example, the dog reactive part, and they're worried about it. So then you just address it in the sense of going back to square one, if it turns out that your dog is seeming a little bit off today, or that if you think your dog is just doing great and you're not paying attention anymore, Reset yourself and go, you know what, let me just start some basics, one-on-one, -on -one, square one basics again with my dog and just go forward again. And just, there's nothing wrong with pushing them. You know, if you get, uh, if you were to be, you know, um, uh, um, like I say, if you were walking down the street and says some stranger 
random stranger just walked up to you without looking. They look at you, they're smiling at you, and then they suddenly punch you in the face. And you go down to the ground, and it doesn't matter if the guy gets caught, goes to jail, what it doesn't matter. You will forever be paranoid and scared when you're walking down, especially that same street, and especially when someone makes eye contact with you. You will be forever afraid that that similar type of person or that another random stranger will punch you in the face. How do you fix that? You can't. You got to get over it over time. You got to keep practicing. You got to keep willing yourself not to do it. Your dog needs your help to get past these points. They, they, you have to be consistent. They're looking for reasons to fail on purpose because it's just easier for your dog to go back into what they've always been doing before because they've been doing it their entire life. So when you go to that point where we change the progress and we shift it forward, me or any trainer, it's, it, it's a matter of you shifting your own behavior in the sense of I'm paying attention. I teach all my, uh, all my, all my clients, pay attention to your dog. Pretend that you're on your cell phone. Well, pretend your dog is on your, on your cell phone and that you're watching your dog, your cell phone, 90% of the time. We can watch our cell phone while we're walking down a busy sidewalk and not run into anybody because we're always there and then we look up and we there and then we look up, right? We just do a glance, right? We've got 90% here and, and a tenth up there, and that's it. And we're paying attention. You got to do that with your dog, but the reality is most people don't. Most people are kind of like, okay, well, you know, it's just a dog or, you know, it seems okay. And a lot of times people uh, subconsciously lead themselves to fail with their dog because then they deliberately or oh, subconsciously stop paying attention to their dog. And I've seen that before. I'm like, okay, pay attention to your dog. I'm like, okay, and they look away because they don't know what they're, ta uh, what they're looking at or that they just don't think they can control their dog. So they put themselves up to fail by not looking at the dog. So then that way we say, well, that's why you fail. You know, when... When I was acting, uh, going to auditions, and I was going through some uh, pretty big uh, auditions and stuff like that, I would sabotage myself because I would think I wouldn't make it, I wouldn't get the part or whatever, and that I would fail. And so then I just sabotage. I wouldn't read my lines. I wouldn't memorize it. I wouldn't even get a scene partner to work my lines. I would just go, okay, well, whatever. And then I would go in and it would be a horrible, horrible audition. If I set myself up to fail, I will absolutely fail. And then I give myself the excuse, well, I knew I was going to fail anyway, so that's why I failed. This is what we're doing with our dogs. I know my dog's reactive, and he's going to be reactive no matter what, so what am I going to do? I'll, I'll, I'll just wait till he gets reactive, and if he's not reactive, I'll hope and pray that he doesn't get reactive. And if he doesn't get reactive, oh my gosh, thank goodness, but if he gets reactive, oh, well, it happened, and I knew it was going to happen. We have to be proactive in the aspects of keeping our dog on track, keeping ourselves on track. If it seems like it's too easy, too good, it's complacent, whatever, go back to square one, reset yourself, don't push your dog to fail, right? Because like I say here, you know, if we have a trauma, it's gonna take us months and years to get over this trauma. Your dog is existing in the moment. Your dog exists in the mo moment, right? Overt codependence, they exist in the moment. They're not premeditated, they're consequential to their environment. If you shift, if you do something differently with your dog, they're gonna make the adjustment to your behavior. They're gonna look for the weaknesses that are happening or the inconsistencies in your supervision and in your training. If they don't think you're paying attention and watching out for dangers, they're gonna be, okay, they're no longer watching out for dangers, I need to look for dangers. Uh, the people who work with me, they know I, I, I look everywhere all the time when I'm with them, with their dog, and I teach them this. It was just a different story here, but I just a few people have commented on that, uh, sent me messages and so forth. And, um, you know, same thing with the, the, the shelter aspect of it is just don't let your dog, you know, like a foster aspect of it, like a, a, a thing, just don't set your dog up to fail. Got a behavioral issue and your dog's three years old, do you think a week is going to change your dog's behavior? No. I always say as a rule of thumb, if it's three, three years, then it's three months. One year, one month is, is, the, is what I say to, to set that up. And there are people who are willing to be patient and go, you know what, yeah, my dog's three years old. Mm. Right? And they go, well, you know, I, I can't handle this, I can't do this, whatever. But the reality is, if you think about it, three years old, say the dog's three years old, right? 36 months. Three months out of 36 months, right? That's, that's like, what is it, 8%. That's 
that's eight percent of your dog's entire life that we're asking that I'm asking you to just be consistent with. Um, you know, that's that's all. Because because the thing is, then it ends up being the fact that then they get frustrated and then the dog ends up failing and then it's just a really oh, horrible thing. Um, and I also talked to somebody else today on the phone. Um, they had hired a, a local trainer who, um, you know, Caesar Milan and all this kind of stuff. And I'll get into that another day. And, and this, this man, um, was like a child, uh, you know, some of the instructions that he sent them in a, in a form here and he's got a picture of himself holding, you know, with Caesar Milan. I'm like, so what? Who cares? I know Zach Scout. He's the executive trainer, uh, director of training for, for Caesar. Who cares? You don't see my, his picture up on here. The thing is that this guy is saying, don't give your dog any attention, no emotional attention. Let them know that you're alpha and all that stuff. And, you know, use a, sh a, a prong collar on your dog. Make him sit on his bed. And he always has to go to his bed. Don't let him come. Don't let him on the couch. Don't let him come upstairs. All these things. I'm like, wow, this is like, could you imagine going out with a guy like that? Like, imagine the way you would be treated as a human being if he thinks that about an animal about your own dog, about someone's dog, that they're just dumb, stupid property. It's like you, you're not, you tell them, you're not even allowed to let their dog onto their own couch. Put a blanket up, right? They've got a, like, you, what? You won't? You, you won't let your dog, you tell them, they, he actually told them not to let their dog upstairs. So that means their dog stays downstairs. And, then, and they've said, too, is that they know times when they can hear their dog walking around. And once they come down the stairs, he runs to his bed. It's like, what? And then he tells them to buy a certain type of bed for their dog. And, and even they were saying, what's the difference between the bed he already has and a, and, a, and a special expensive bed that they bought off of Amazon? So it's not like he's making any money off of it. But it's like, well, how does that make sense? And then a prong collar, and all they do, they, 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 this this the silly trainer causes an emotional disenfranchisement, low self esteem issues, and so forth like that. And the dog develops even further aggression issues and, and re reaction issues and other aspects of this behavior that becomes an antisocial in the sense of their dog is no longer able to understand that they have any validity or value within the relationship of the home, of the family. And, and I just go, wow, this is just brutal. Cause I mean, you didn't talk about the alpha stuff and the, and I talk about the alpha thing, right? That John Pollock brought up from, um, right? He's a great guy. And he's, like I said, he says, I can talk about this stuff. And he talks about, you know, um, you know, alpha pair in the wolf pack alpha male, alpha female, and then they take care of the rest of the family and all that stuff. And I said, this it's mom and dad. That's it. We're just doing parenting. We wouldn't exile our child into a corner. I mean, right? And I said to them as well, imagine you're doing, you're at school and you're, you know, you're jerking around and being a goofball, the teacher catches you. And then they take you and say, okay, you sit here at your desk right beside my desk and they make you sit up in the front. Right? How many people are going to ridicule you afterwards? How are you going to feel sitting there by the teacher for just doing something just silly that is unwarranted? And you want to be like, oh, that's not cool. And you're, you're embarrassed. Your, your, your self-esteem is affected. Your self-worth. But then this guy's telling this, these, these, these people to do it to their own dogs. And he's telling other people. And he has a Caesar Milan picture up on his website. So then that makes other people go, oh, my gosh, you know Caesar Milan. Oh, my gosh. What the heck, man? Like, 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 wow. And the people who were talking to me on the, on the speakerphone and they're, and they're like, yeah, it makes us cry. Cause we thought we're, you know, we can't be nice to our own, to our dog anymore. So I don't know. It's just, it's just so sad the way, the, the way society is being taught by the people who claim to be at the top of the food chain locally or wherever. And then they start saying some of the most dumbest things. The other thing too, this guy's got like a photo on his website of a slip collar. And anybody who knows a slip collar knows how they work. I'll show you the slip collar. I'll be right back.
Yes, Minky. Minky just hit his head trying to run away. I know, Minky. Good. So, so, so this is a slip collar. This is a slip collar. So here's how silly this guy is. I mean, I, and I'm just like, wow, this is, a, this is how asinine and arrogant a person is. So say this is a dog's neck right here, okay? So on the photo, the slip collar is right here. And the caption that says in the slip collar, there's two photos. So there's one like this, and then there's one like this. Where, oh, sorry, there's one where the thing is up this way, and there's one that is this way, okay? So in, in his meme, in his, in his caption, the first one where it's like this, it says incorrect. Okay, it says incorrect because it's on the side. And then the next photo where it's up like this, it says correct. And I was like, dude, are you that arrogant and stupid? Like, like conceited? This is three, three inches, four inches. That's all it is. This is incorrect, but this is correct? Anybody who's had a dog on a collar knows the collar goes all over the place anyways. It slips everywhere. But he's actually going out there and saying that this is incorrect and this is correct. Three, four inches. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. And he charges $450 for, three, uh, for two sessions. One for two hours and the next one is an hour. $450. Bucks. And he's telling them this alpha thing, and you can't have your dog. And then he said, get him a prong collar as well. He and they said, doesn't, uh, they said to him, doesn't the prong collar hurt my dog? And he said, no, it doesn't. He said, no, it doesn't hurt your dog. Here's something. I said to them, I've tried the prong collar on myself because I can't go and complain about something if I haven't tried it. Same with the shock collar I've had on my hand. It hurts. Like when you hold it in your hand, it hurts like crazy. Put the prong collar, just putting it on hurts like crazy. And right, I have gains so that, I have, you know, people have brought them off and they're like, we don't want them anymore. The, the, the prong collar, like we don't want the prong collar anymore. We can see why it's inhumane. And so they have it around the neck. I have it around my neck and it's just, just resting. I'm not even using any power because it hurts like crazy, and I, and I went, oh, maybe I'll pull on it, and I put on it a little bit, and it just digs in, and it doesn't just dig in, it pulls into the skin because it ch uh, cinches in, just like a slip collar, just like the slip collar. It cinches in, and it pulls on the skin forward, and it hurt like freaking crazy, and I didn't pull that hard, and I have a pretty high pain tolerance. So you got to be careful who you're working with. you got to be consistent with stuff like that, but just – Anyhow, just don't set your dog up to fail. Look for the trainers that make sense that are going on. Don't look for the flash and all stuff. You know, and they're talking about the science-based garbage and all that stuff. I talk about the science-based aspect on the psychological, psychosomatic aspects of things, the, 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 the psychosis, which is the bridging of uh, looking at how things are psychosis-wise with humans and dogs, and by bridging that, creating corollary uh, effect to it. Like, well, if it happens in humans, it's got to happen in dogs because of our cohabitative uh, evolution, right? I, emotional isomorphism. It's got to have some sort of relational aspect of the behaviors because there's no way two different species can live together unless they're sharing something similar, which is emotional. And I, again, call it emotional isomorphism. And people, uh, trainers like, ha, 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 he's an idiot. No, such word. Well, yeah, because you guys don't even think deep enough. But the reality is if we're running parallel with dogs and we're living in a home with dogs, and like I say, only when they're domesticated, are we able to share emotional parallels? Dogs rudimentary, humans a bit more complex because of our sophisticated brain structure. And I've said the same, said the same thing too. Uh, you take a domesticated dog that learns things from us and has the emotional context, and you just if you were to abandon that dog in the wild, in a couple of months that dog's going to forget about 40% of everything that they've known as a stray. If the dog stays out there and breeds and three generations in, everything is gone from that dog. It's all diluted. That domesticated dog is now a true wild dog. It's gone. But these scientists continue on this aspects of this and, and, and then they come up with this dumb things of brute force behavior, alpha. Where did alpha came from? It came from the psychology, the, psycho, uh, the, the behaviorist, right? That's where it came from. All the stuff, all of it coming from Pavlov, 1897, right? The Russian guy. Uh, publishing his thing when people couldn't vote, uh, women couldn't vote, when when 
people owned slaves. And so they predicate all that. Then they go to B.F. Skinner and his operant conditioning and his four quadrants. Google B.F. Skinner debunked. And you'll see a whole host of uh, psychiatrists and, and, and learned professionals saying, yeah, B.F. Skinner's an idiot. Even though they predicate a lot of the human psychology on his behavior, uh, his, his, his theories, and then does the operant conditioning. And he says, well, yeah, you could teach anybody anything. Well, you can't teach me much. You can't teach me not to be, uh, you know, insecure about auditions. So it just comes to these points. You know, it, it's just so tough to see things. I'm on my rail. It's a Monday night rail. Wait till you hit Friday again, and now James is going to be off again and all that. But it just... This thing that just goes and absolutely frustrates me. Stop pushing your dog. Stop going to trainers that don't know what the heck they're talking about. Stop talking. Just don't hire a trainer that uses brute force. I don't care where you are in North America, UK, Asia. Don't hire a trainer that uses brute force. Don't hire a trainer that says to get a prong collar or uses a prong collar. Don't hire a trainer that uses a shock collar. These are amateur, inexperienced professionals. I can understand people at home who do it themselves because of that. Okay, that's absolutely fine in that sense. I, I can't, I have, you know, it's your choice. When it comes to the professionals, you're paying a professional to do something with their intuition and their talent. You're not paying a professional to use a tool that you could go to Walmart and buy. You're teaching, you're, you're, I'm sorry, you're, you're paying a professional to teach you what to do to how to assess your dog's behavior. You're not teaching a professional to say, yeah, put on a prong collar on your dog so you can force brute force compliance, basically punching your dog in the face, essentially. Don't want to hire a trainer or behaviorist, especially a behaviorist that's going to start prescribing medication for your dog without telling you what your dog's issues are. When you hire a behaviorist, especially like a PhD behaviorist and all that stuff, as I said before, they create a legal document on the behavior of your dog and they always almost always say your dog dies or your dog lives in, in my dysfunctions with the dogs I deal with they either live or they die all in the same evaluation report I've seen evaluation reports where people like Brando the Pitbull uh, uh, all right where, where the 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 Whatever, behaviors goes in and, and does that, and she's just throwing treats on the floor while the dog is biting her. And it's like, well, okay, that's really smart. And then recommends in her, in her report, because I saw the report, and it says, even after a year of training, this dog is unlikely to have any improvement in his, in his progress, and his quality of life should be taken into account. Quality of life, you should kill your dog, behavioral euthanasia. Took me two hours to have Brando Walking around, like this is where he's designated uh, dangerous dog by uh, the city of North Vancouver and, and two year old, right? And, and I've talked about this before. And he's within two hours, he's walking around other dogs. He's not trying to attack people. He, he's not freaking out when people come from behind cars and parked cars. He's not getting upset. He's a couple of dogs actually run up to him and he doesn't even react. And he, then he looks at his own, like, did I do good? Like, what, I didn't get upset. What, right? It, it's like, they're just covering their butts and they don't care, but they create a legal document because if that ever happens where you have an issue with your dog, and I'm not consult, con counseling anyone to break the law or anything like that. I just want you to be aware of your, 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 your logical processes in regards to doing that. When you hire somebody who does that and then something happens with your dog a week or a month or a year later, and then they say, well, have you ever been to a trainer or they talk to your neighbors? Have you ever been to, uh, do you know if they've gone to see a trainer or whatever? And they go, yeah, I think they went and saw uh, Dr. Uh, Ledger. And then they go and contact Dr. Rebecca Ledger and say, hey, um, just wondering, have you ever seen this? And then they talk to, the, talk to you, the owner, and say, is it okay if we, we heard you went to see uh, a Dr. Ledger? Can we uh, talk to her on your behalf? And, of course, you don't want your dog to be in trouble. So, yeah, yeah go ahead. Because you think if I don't say it, then, right? And then they get the, they get the legal report from Dr. Ledger. And they go, Okay, well, here a year ago, the Dr. Ledger said you should also do this and this and this, and your dog was, in her, her opinion, is such and such. And then there goes the death knoll. Well, maybe not the death knoll, but, you know. So it's just be really careful who you hire. And don't hire the BCSPCA people. Uh, it's a money grab. 
I mean, they made $39.1 million last year in donations, pay their salary, uh, salary and executive staff almost $2 million. That's a lot of money that your donations have gone. They, 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 they killed a puppy that they couldn't train, and then they use donations to bury, to bury the, the news piece in Google. Right? I've talked about that before in some of my other posts. They use your money, and who knows how many thousands of dollars, because I've done Google ad it's expensive words. And so they spend all that money to force all the negative news onto the second page. So whenever you go and look, North, Van, uh, North Vancouver BCSPCA kills puppy, it's on the second page. So their ranking, it gets forced down and your donations go to that. And then they're also doing the Be Kind, uh, uh, sorry, Animal Kind program. Sorry, Be Kind, I'm saying the Ellen DeGeneres, I'm like, oh, okay, some maybe plagiarism, marketing plagiarism on it. And so they're calling Animal Kind, certifying trainers and behaviors, but, they can't even train a puppy. And that's what, it's just this money grab on the backs of our dog's precious lives. And these people don't care. These organizations don't care. If they did care, they wouldn't be so arrogant. They wouldn't be saying that we can train and certify, or not train, but we can certify dog trainers and behaviors under our animal kind program which they charge an exorbitant amount of money for. Or the trainer that goes, yeah, I'm here with Caesar Milan. Here's my photo, so that means I'm the authority. But use a prong collar, even though it's archaic and it is the most useless thing in the world. There's a guy out in uh, Richmond as well, Richard Chan, and I, I call him Richard Chan out, outward. I mean, he's openly talked about kicking dogs if he has to. There's a video of him. Oh, I'm not going to tell because you might take it down. Um, well, there's a video where he's taught walking with a dog, and then there's another dog that comes, just a stranger's dog comes towards the dog he's walking with, and he, and he starts to freak out and pull the other dog back. And Richard brings, right, he starts to freak out and bring the other dog back, and then, and he, and then he goes on camera and he says, you know, if that dog got close, I would have kicked it. Really? Wow. And he uses a shock collar on the dog. And the reason why I'm upset with him is because uh, Kathy Larimer, who uh, some of you Dane people know, she sent Richard a great Dane, because she asked me if I had room. I said, I don't have any room for, for that. And plus the dog that she was talking about named Woody, Woody the Great Dane, wasn't a, a really, was a really easy issue. But then she, I said, who do you send him to? And she says, well, we're sending him to, to Richard Chan, who charged, I think, $3,000 to shock collar, to abuse your dog with a shock collar. And Richard already sent me emails threatening to sue me. So go ahead, Richard. You can sue me all you want. There's, so he sends, so Kathy Lermer, who, who I've asked her for a statement of account, and she's refused to offer it. And she's supposed to be a charity, which means by law in the U.S., she has to produce it or have some access to it. So she hasn't. And Woody, this great Dane that spent a couple months in the shelter, goes to Richard and he shock collars a dog and he leaves a dog in a kennel which there's no truly right size plastic kennel that will fit a Great Dane. It's not meant to sleep overnight because it's so small, right? I mean, it's so tiny and people go, oh, dogs love being in the kennel and all stuff. The dysfunctional dog, no. And he puts Woody in the kennel downstairs in the basement of his home in the wintertime. It was like October, November and then and then Richard's like showing off how great he is with Woody and all that stuff, down training Woody and all these photos on Instagram and all that stuff. He's training Woody and all that stuff, how great he is. Great Danes have very short hair, right? Very short fur. It's very, very short. There's not a lot of heat being kept in there. It's in the wintertime. And how do I, and why I'm complaining about this, why am I railing on this is because it's freaking cold in there. And how do I know it's freaking cold? Because they're in the photo that dear old Richard shows of him training Woody, the dysfunctional dog with a shock collar on him, right? Because again, nothing wrong with, you know, there's nothing better than if you have a dysfunction, might as well just keep hurting the dog with some un, unspecified pain out of nowhere. Like I talk about, you know, the dog getting stung by a bee, right? That, the previous episodes. So there's nothing like making your dog completely 
freaked out by being punched in the head, being stung by a bee with no idea why and where it happened. It's compliance, it's brute force compliance, and that's a professional. I can understand, again, if somebody at home is doing, you guys, right? I can understand that because you're not a professional. You're not getting paid $3,000 for like four weeks of brute force training. So the picture of, of uh, Richard training Woody, the dysfunctional dog coming in from California. So California is really warm, right? In the wintertime. How do I know it's cold in the, in the, in the room? Because dear old Richard is wearing a winter jacket, a fluffy winter jacket with a park uh, with a, a toucan. If it's too cold for Richard to be in the basement of his own home, it's effing freezing for Woody, the dog that came from California, where it's probably 25 degrees in the winter. Well, I was, I've been, <laughs> and then I tell Kathy. Hey, you know what? This guy's horrible. He's he's brute force. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Yada yada, and everything. And she goes, "Well, you know, it's not up to me, dude. You do that. You sent him to you. To, you sent Richard, you, the Woody. You sent the dog to this guy. And I told you before you even sent him that he was bad, that he's he's a shot caller, and that he's threatening to kick dogs. But Kathy's like, well, whatever. I don't care." I'm not paying for the donations, and some do, uh, some rescue in Washington paid for it. <laughs> it's like, wow. So if you know Kathy, I would disavow myself of her. If you know Richard, I would disavow myself of his services. This other guy here who brags about being with um, Caesar Milan. It's the arrogance of humanity and it's the arrogance of men. You know, I'm not the greatest guy. I didn't get to where I am in my life of like, you know, where I am present in my mind. I mean, not like status wise, because I'm not anywhere status wise, but as who I am as a human being, I've gone, I was never the greatest guy in the world, not the greatest partner either. I've gone through these things and, and realized I need to change the way my life is and understand the empathy that is within me, with other people, with animals. And then I see these things of people who are my age, just brute forcing things. And here's the thing, my accolades, right, my references, I, I talk about, and I talk about because I have to, people go, oh, he's always bragging, James is always bragging about the stuff. But I have to, otherwise I can't market myself. Because nobody else is going to say, well, you know what? Yeah, right? So, okay, so I'm recognized by the Court of New York, Southampton Animal Shelter in New York, Animal Hope and Wellness Foundation, largest Great Dane Rescue in North America, Richmond Animal Protection Society. I'm recognized all by all these things, and all the stuff that I've ever done, I've stood and consistently performed at. So, I'm not out there playing the game. I'm not out there with Renee Erdman. I'm not out there with Dr. Rebecca Ledger, Dr. Claudia Richard. I'm not out there sucking up to, to Sheila Begg, uh, who backstabbed me. I'm not, I'm not sucking up to all these clique trainers, Abel, Amber Cotto in my little area. I'm not sucking up to any of these. I'm actually confronting them and saying, you guys are doing it wrong, and you're making it worse for the dysfunctional dog because you don't understand what's going on. And then they go and attack me, and they attack me. And I go, whatever, and I keep going on it, and I'll keep fighting this. That's why I say, please share my work because – these are the people who don't want what we're doing to be known. And anybody, all the people who've hired me, uh, Ivy's, uh, all these people, you know it, what I do works 100%. The most basic dog, most basic dysfunctions, digging in the backyard to the dog that's peeing in the house, to the dog that is extremely skittish, that bites through their, their leashes, to the dog that wants to stalk and trap and kill a human being. I've, I've done the whole thing. I get trolled mercilessly, I get all that, but I keep doing it and I keep forcing it. And like Christina, you said, right? Criticism. Either you hide and it and just let it go away, but your 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 work, my work, my voice never gets heard. And then I see these things, these comments about these people who are doing stuff. And I'm talking, I'm talking to owners who are literally like today, she said, the the, the this this family, she said. I feel like crying right now. I can't believe I've been doing this to my dog. And I thought, we thought so ourselves we were doing it wrong, but he's a trainer. 
You got to say no to the worst people in the world sometimes. It's just it's really tough. So don't push the pro. Okay, so getting back to everything, don't push the progress. Don't look for the magic fixes. Just do the freaking work, guys. Just do the work. If it turns out it's not working, go back to square one. Step right back down to square one. I have the same issues here too, my own end, with my own dogs, the dogs I, I work with, the, the dogs that people hire me for in-house. If I screw up, I, I go back to square one again. And in my case, when I screw up, these dogs either try to attack other people, other dogs, or me. And usually it's me because they hold it against me, not in the sense of anything other than the fact you're the only person that I can trust. You know how you can be cruel, very mean and cruel to the person that loves you the most because you know inside of you that they'll forgive you? I've learned this from all the dogs that I've worked with. They're willing to attack me because they understand that I'll forgive them. Right? You know, like my hand. I mean, I can't, I can't close my hands, right? I've got scars all over the place, right? I've got, I've got stuff that, where I've been attacked, everything, right? And I'm lucky. And when they come after me, I go, okay, I forgive you. Because it's just, you're, you've had a whole hard life. And it's my fault for not being consistent, not paying attention. I go back to square one. Because I know in my head, if I screw up, the dog in my life that I'm taking care of at that particular moment, if I screw up, that dog has a very real, not a maybe, not a second strike, they have a very real possibility of being killed because then they look at the history of what goes on. They contact the rescue. They do all these kinds of things. It's my fault if that happens. I go back to square one. I start with square one again. You know, that's the thing. Okay. Um, I'm going to go to the next thing here. I just got to do it because I think I'm kind of running... 52 minutes here it says so I want to do it in, in the next 20 minutes I want to talk about the thing um, in regards to dogs that are afraid of walking on oh actually you know what before I even go that uh, Sammy I have a rescue dog that is so fearful of strangers she poops every time someone comes over you know I have a, uh, a video um, of Loki actually let me see if I can bring up Loki I'll do I'm gonna bring up Loki and I will switch the camera around and Oh, actually, I can't switch the camera around. Sorry, because oh, the stupid Facebook thing. Okay, forget. It. I can't show you the. I can't show you the Loki video. Um, uh, Loki is a stress defecator. Uh, uh, so he's stressed. He defecates. Sammy Minky's the same thing. Minky stressed out. Minky poos on the floor, right? Because they don't usually pee. They pee out of a different aspect of insecurity uh, of behavior. Uh, when the dog poos, it's because, again, it's not that fight or flight aspect of it. It's just because they feel a certain change and a shift in the way the body is held in the tension aspect of it. And, of course, they feel the discomfort and it comes out. She puts out every time someone comes over. Well, what kind of dog is that? Is that a, is that a Dane that you have, Sammy? Because I know you're out in Hawaii, right, if I remember who you are. Um, if she does poop, it's got to, you know, got to take into context why she poops and all that stuff and what her, her, her psychology is and all that behavior. So everything that's behind her and all that part. Um, but more than anything else, it, it could be that she's just, you know, might be afraid of confrontation, might be afraid of eye contact, might be afraid that, um, someone's going to try to approach her and that she doesn't know how to deal with socialized, uh, socialized behavior with humans and all that so it's a bit of a, of a tough one now ivy says hi james this is ivy my baby is hooligan and i remember a hooligan I, I i worked with hooligan he's a really cute little guy um i have a question about how to control high prey driving dogs he's been pretty bad with the prey drive lately he goes crazy when there's a submissive dog um okay so because uh, we worked together right at, at the park there that day uh, regards to prey drive um he would start by trying to play with them. And then when the dog starts being submissive, like laying down, he would start biting really hard, pulling and shaking on it. Okay. So is he pulling and shaking violently or is he pulling and shaking somewhat like moderately? Most of the time the dog will yelp, but hooligan won't stop. He thinks it's a game or something. It's frustrating to see he keeps scarring, scaring the other dogs, especially their owners. I'm afraid as hooligan keeps going burger, he will accidentally hurt a smaller dog. Thank you. Okay. So what you should do, uh, Ivy, 
is just bring him over to you every single time, like I talked about before, and reset him. And this hold on to him for a couple of minutes, like even upwards of three long, long, long minutes, 180 seconds. Just have him just there. If you have to put him on a leash or you have to hold him by a collar, don't let him get away from you and just hold him there and let him just calm himself down and let him reset. And as I talk to you about how to touch him, so just do that, touch his joy spot and just let him relax, let him be calm and then slowly let him go. And if he tries to dart away, then you hold on to him before you let him go and then you slowly let him go when he's not trying to dart away. When you're feeling that he's calm, and he immediately doesn't matter, the minute you let go of him, he's just gonna burst off anyways, but you don't want him to lead you into being uh, uh, released. When it comes to him playing with the other dogs, walk over to where he's playing with the other dogs, and like I said, right, don't, don't be upset with him, you just walk over to him, and you pull him off. Say it in a nice way, don't have to be mean. You just pull them off and say hooligan, and then you just give them a timeout, right? You give them a reset. Three-minute reset. Every single time. It's the same thing like I talk about dogs humping each other in the park. or well, not each other. One, one dog's always humping. You just, right? It's just rude behavior. The owner should stop their dog from doing it, but they're, you know, they're usually like, oh, it's just cute, or no, don't worry about it, whatever. It's like, no, it's rude. It's just, it's impolite rude behavior between dogs in a domestic socializing environment stop your dog from humping my dog if you're if hooligan is going after and and, and, and t what he's hooligans essentially doing is because he's so energetic in his behavior right hooligans is a really energetic young dog he's just going to keep pushing and pushing right because when we were there for i think like over an hour he just kept playing with different dogs and he wasn't even tired right so that's cool it's understandable he's a puppy <laughs> but Wherever he is, just walk over to him. And you would just say his name as I, I was told you how before, right? Check in with him. Say his name, walk over. When he starts playing with another dog, check in with him again. When he's being a goofball, you walk over to him, you take him, you check in again. If he doesn't stop, you pull him out, give him a timeout. You don't give him bad. He's just like, you know, you just cuddle with him. So he goes, oh, okay, cool. We don't want to make his response to us feeling adversive to us, like, oh, shoot, I get in trouble and my mom yells at me now. He just thinks, oh, mom's giving me another hug. And he likes it, right? Uh, dogs are codependent. So just, just set him in that way. Uh, and we can talk on the phone about this too, Ivy, um, because like I say, right, I, I provide lifetime um, uh, phone support for free, right? I mean, and that's the thing. Like, it's not like, I'm not like Bark Busters where I say, oh, I'm going to give you a lifetime and then I don't phone you after two sessions. <laughs> right this is you just pay one fee and i'll help you over the phone um i can say for free uh okay so mary crawford uh, no no doc should use prong call I, I agree yeah i agree Corey, prong collars with a round tip or sharp tip i've had the prong collar cory uh i've had it where it was just a dull end of it i mean my skin is like every human skin right i mean you've seen dogs pawing at each other with the claws like the danger right when they paw right they can they they create they create cuts in the skin and they can play with each other and they're like, ah, oh, and they're like yanking on each other. And you've seen dogs, your big dogs, small dogs, they ha hang onto each other's neck and they're throwing it, right? And they're like, whatever. You can see the skin pulling out this way. And the other dog's like, yeah, this is fun. With us, they do that to us, they rip our skin apart. So, yeah, there's a little bit thicker. And the way they process pain is through a redundancy format of it, right? Yeah, I'll get to that one of these days with y'all. Uh, but either or, and both are, are just, yeah, yeah. You know the thing is the prong collars, I guarantee you it's invented by a man, right? You know, I, I love women. Uh, you know, uh, I'm on Tinder. I'm on Bumble. I, I, I absolutely love women and all stuff. So I'm not like I hate men or anything like that because, you know, I'm a guy. I'm just saying a lot of these insecure owners, uh, all that stuff they learn from the people who are teaching them, and a lot of the guys do that, right? Uh, animal abuse, all that stuff, right? It comes from – it's usually guys, right? Uh, prong collars, uh, using a prong collar makes the dog lose trust in their owner, I think. Alpha psychology is like for the wild wolves, not domesticate dogs. Okay, so so the one thing, Corey, is you're right. But also with the wild wolf is the fact that they have a, a familial structure, right? Alpha male, alpha female, right? Parenting, mom and dad, and all the dogs, all the wolves in it are part of their family because they take care of all the family. You have the scout dogs, that, uh, the scout wolf that goes out and makes sure that they can see where they're up ahead and all that stuff. They, 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 they take care of their older dogs and all that, uh, the older wolves, I'm sorry. 
everything, right? And if there's another wolf that comes into the pack and that earns themselves into the pack after the fights and all that stuff happening, they become in the position of the family. Like they're adopted. Like we adopt dogs into our family. So that's the kind of behavior that I'm, I'm talking about. But if you, the other thing is about wild wolves is, oh, Sammy's pretty, Sammy's so cute. She's looking at a, a fly down there. Um, if you look at the way uh, with wild wolves, there are people who are actually rescuing wild wolves and they have them in the back of their sanctuary. And you see some photos where people have the wolf inside their home. Right? Tonka, uh, Walter, was bigger. Uh, I mean, is bigger than a, a wolf. 180 plus pounds. Bigger, taller, heavier than a wolf. He's in the house. Same when it comes to the wolves. You see these people, uh, and, and, and he had predatorial aspects of it, you know, dragging the shelter worker into his kennel. Where I showed people a photo of the, the injury of the, the shelter worker. It's like a chunk of skin is missing, 42 stitches. So is, he's got the predatorial behavior to stalk, trap, and kill human beings because he did. Well, now you didn't kill anybody. He tried to uh, a few times. One guy said, I would take, I was gonna, I'll, I'll take a shotgun and kill him because uh, he attacked his mom and, and uh, uh, somebody else in his family. Um, but you see, they're living with the wolf in the sanctuary, and the wolf comes up and starts jumping on the human being in the back of the sanctuary. And the guy's like, yeah, that's cool. Same with bears, right? There's a familial structure with dogs, with animals, with wolves, with bears. There's a, an article, on, I saw a link from Psychology Today, a link today that was posted in, in one of the dog training groups. I think there's a, a behaviorist named Mark Burkhoff or something, and he talks about the questionality, questioning whether or not dogs have emotional context or not. And, and he essentially says they do, which is what I say, what you say, everyone says. Uh, the domesticated dog is the genus that is not being recognized, right? Because, the Corey, you know, I love these points that you bring up. The, the domesticated dog all these, is a genus, right? It's a strain of canines that we ourselves, humans, have domesticated, where our domestication of the dog is an arbitrary domestication because if we don't have the dog in the home and there's just a wild dog, like a puppy, you leave it out in the wild with the mom and all that stuff in the, in the family, that dog becomes a wild dog. So we domesticate the domesticate the dog ourselves what good questions to ask a trainer when, when you're looking for one this is what i do and i always get people who get angry at me how many dogs have you recommended to be killed how many dogs have you medicated what is the tools that you use to work with a dog what are some of the extreme tools that you have to use when working with a dog what aspects do you use when working with a dog what is your opinion about the dog psychology? What is your opinion about the dog having a codependency? What is your opinion about the dog, how they process things? Um, when you, do, when you, you send an email to the trainer and they go and you just say, hey, you know, I just need to know um, what you, you just say, like, I need to know what you charge for training or what kind of training do you offer? I have a dog that's aggressive. See what that trainer asks you for. And that's, I, have a, I have a post in there as well. I talk about what to ask your trainer, why your trainer asks for photos of your dog. Well, I'm the only one that does that apparently. Uh, a couple of people do, but they're you know, animal empaths and all that stuff. But wait to see what the trainer says to you. You know, I'm gonna answer this in another post because that's an excellent question, Corey. Absolutely excellent question because I have a very unique perspective on things. And because I bill myself as the only trainer in the North America, if not the world, that works with predatorial dogs and with 100% accuracy, I have a certain focus and a certain perspective on things. And it's it's unique, it's atypical. I mean, I, I have a very unique gift with dogs, so I have a certain perspective. And I only have a certain dedication to the dogs that are really dangerous. So I'm only looking in that format. So I'll answer that uh, the another, uh, maybe tomorrow um, into regards of what to look for in a trainer or behaviors. You most certainly don't want a trainer that's gonna throw treats to your dog. Especially if you have a reactive dog. If they're throwing treats, they're scared. Absolutely 100% scared. It's please like me, here's some treats, but I don't know if I can trust you, so I'm gonna throw treats so you don't bite me. Be careful of the trainer that talks about prescribing medication for your dog almost right away. 
right? I understand people don't have the skill set that I have, and that's totally cool. So then just let's see how far they start to step that in, where they say, well, you need to have treats or you need to have medication. Right? I've heard stories of Dr. Ledger and Dr. Claudia Richter, where they're standing on the other side of a wall or door or whatever, fence, uh, table, and they're throwing treats at their dog, at the, at the owner's dog. And then talk, and then they say, and they just stand there talking to us for 45 minutes. And then they go, you know what, you should do this. And they start prescribing medication or they say certain kind of comments. And then it's like $400 later for an hour and their dog is nowhere any better. And they're actually got a prescription for another couple hundred dollars worth of medication. And then the behaviorist goes home and does a legal document on your dog. Every single person that I've worked with, right? You see the Axel video, you see everything. Diesel, right? You guys who've been following this. Just bring the freaking dog here. If you don't, if, if, if you can hold on to your dog and you know that your dog won't attack me, you won't lose grip of your dog, even though it's happened a couple of times, right? I, like I said, I had a massive come up from me from their owner within the first five minutes, a heavier dog for her, and it got me in the, in the armpit through my jacket. And the bruise was huge afterwards, right? Because they have such an impact, of, uh, right? A, a blunt force uh, bite on them. And I'm and I continue to work with their dog. I don't care. It's just I just said to just make sure you have a hold on him now. I'm scared. I'm freaked out. When I meet somebody for the first time with their dog, hey, make sure you hold on to your dog. I teach them how to hold on with the, the, the strap around their, their their wrist, right? Because it's a proper way and it also guarantees they're not gonna well, it doesn't guarantee, but it, it further ensures that they're gonna have a strong grip on, on their dog. And I say, Okay, that's cool, right? And People are like, oh, my dog doesn't like people coming into the house and is reactive and will bite people. Okay, well, then put your dog on a leash and I'll come to the door. That's it. There's other people who say, well, my dog's not bad. He might nip you. He you know, stuff comes to the door, but he doesn't really bite people. He's okay, you know, all that. And all right, well, then if he doesn't need to be a leash, just leave a leash on him. If he doesn't need to be a, a leash on because he's not going to bite anybody, he's never bitten anybody, then just let him have free range around me. Everybody who's worked with me has seen me react this way. I'm, I'm different in the sense that, you know, my, my only drive and concern is to help your dog. Oh, okay, Mike is there. Hi, hey Mike, uh, Sammy, uh, Chihuahua. Your Chihuahua, Sammy, poops when people come by? Okay, yeah, we'll have, you know, you, you have to put up a post about this so I can see what your Chihuahua looks like. I have a, clo I have a reactive dog group. You go to my website, rfrfarkbark.com, go to the tab, free help for your dog, and you can read all the stuff that I've read people's dogs through just photos and their description, and my accuracy is pretty bang on. And you can read what people have said, so you see everything. So nothing's hidden. Nothing's like, oh, well, I'm going to show you a 12-second clip of something, or I'm going to show you a little excerpt. It's all there. You can follow it through. And these are the real people, a lot of people in these different dog groups, for example, Dane, Great Dane groups, you guys have seen the names of the same people in these groups. You know, these people are the same people I'm talking about. And then I go through and I go all that stuff. Uh, sounds like I'll keep trying that. It's really all it depends on the day. Well, some, okay. You know, Ivy, we can talk. Um, thank you, Ivy. Uh, we can talk um, no, tomorrow. I have a session. We can talk like Wednesday if you want. Um, just let me know when you're, just send me an email when you're free. And times that you can talk on Wednesday or Thursday, and then I'll give you a call. And like I say, is we'll have a, a, a call and all that stuff. And um, uh, there's no charge, right? It's just because, like, I'm grateful when people hire me. I am. I, and I'm just like, I don't, I'm so thrilled. It's like, oh, my gosh, you want me to help you with your dog. It's like you saying to me, I want you to be the godfather or godmother or god whatever, godparent to my dog or to my child. Like, that's what, like, Right, and when I meet people who say, "Oh yeah, I watch your vlog," I'm like, "Oh my gosh, you watch my vlog? Really? Wow!" I am so grateful to be given the honor to work with your dog that you consider your child. Like, like it just—it's un—it's. I'm just so flattered, uh, honored. It's just—it's just a beautiful feeling to have someone go, "Yeah, my dog, who's I love with all my heart, and is dangerous, and is." going to try to bite other dogs. I want you to work with my dog because I think you can help. Oh, Jody, wow. I'm, 
Hey, Jody. Um, so I'm, I'm just absolutely honored by this, right? And I've done this. Like, like even Animal Hope and Wellness Foundation, right? Like I say, uh, Minky is going back because they breached their agreement after 15 months. They've just, they were supposed to share my posts of my work with Minky in an exchange of me not charging them $9,000 a month. And they didn't. So I just said, I'm done. Take, your, take Minky back. I just, I, I'm done. I can't let people take advantage of me. And then the thing was, it was the Animal Hope and Wellness Foundation could have easily dealt with this issue just by saying, okay, James, we'll share your post. 15 months. Couldn't share my post once or even do any, any promotion about my work or even talk about Miki when I was trying to get him adopted out earlier this year. Not even one share. Not even one post about the work that I did the impossible. That they've had... They've rescued over 20,000 dogs from the Asian meat dog trade. Horrific aspects. You know, Sammy, you talk about your chihuahua is stressed up. Like, these dogs that they've rescued, beyond the horrors that you can imagine. And they've rescued dogs from different aspects of abuse cases in, in Los Angeles and all that stuff, right? You know, the, the, the connected, they, they got the HR 6720 criminalizing human consumption of dog and cat meat in the United States passed by the U.S. Senate, signed into law in, in December. Of all the people in North America, they, they asked me for help. 20,000 plus dogs, and I did it. And I said, this is what, just all you, I'll do it for free. I just, just help promote my work. I'm not out here to, uh, I'm not trying to be a jerk to people. I'm just, I guess I'm just getting old and tired of, of, of this. And I'm getting tired of seeing all these people who are doing things for their own self-satisfaction or self-gratification or promotion and all that stuff. And it, it's hurtful because we're supposed to be helping animals, right? In the dog training, right? It's supposed to be helping dogs. But that's, that's what we're supposed to be doing. And we should, anyways, there's just a bit of my, 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 my little bit of my thing here today. Um, okay. I'm going to just go briefly over the aspect of uh, why dogs are afraid of walking on bridges. Like, we're not talking like the, 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 this couple aspects. You can see the dogs walking over, um, you can see the dogs walking over the bridges with the grates, right? You know, the lattice work, right? The, the grates, they're, they're going that and they don't, and they're afraid to walk on it. Couple, you know, obviously because the paws are sensitive to it and all that, or else you have the dogs walking over the pedestrian bridges over the highway. And some dogs are afraid, or you have your dog in your car, and you're driving over the bridge, and your dog is afraid when you go on the bridge, and they're afraid. An aspect, it's an aspect of a relational, um, uh, re uh, relative, right? It's re relative to their environment, relational environment, right? In the sense of that, if your dog is in your car over the bridge, they can't, they, they see the open air. Physics wise, right? I talk about physics, right? Understanding physics. The dog goes, holy cow, we're up in the air. How are we up in the air? Right? I'm just going to go over briefly on this part, right? No, up in the air, all that stuff. How, how are we up in the air? Because the dog knows that the road is going fast, but they're looking out distance wise, right? Relational. And they're like, there's nothing there. We're going to fall. Dog gets scared, hide. They don't know how to process that part of it. Uh, dog walking over the pedestrian bridge is similar to that part of it because they can see that they're heightened up and they understand the aspect of gravity. They fall, right? Okay, and then the next one is regards to dogs walking over the lattice and all this stuff, understanding of physics because of the fact that to them, this is string. They don't know metal, metal will hold their weight. So aside from the sensitivity to walking on, on, on grates with their, their paws, they don't understand. And it's a depth perception thing as well because of the focus points that they have and the fit understanding of physics of walking over the lattice, over the metal. The metal is thin. It's, it's, it's razor thin to the dog. I'm trying to look at something that looks razor thin and I don't have it here because I wasn't really kind of going on to that part. Um, but yeah, like a receipt here, right? Right? Right. This is what the dog sees. Oh, let me just, that's what the dog sees. So you can imagine what your dog thinks. That's not going to hold my weight. The dog's rudimentary understanding of physics. That's why I'm saying all these, all these academia, these behaviorists, these PhD people, all these people have no idea what the freaking heck they're talking about because they think the dog is dumb and stupid. 
I have, I, I hate heights. I don't mind heights, but I hate heights. How's that? I will never go skydiving because I'm afraid of dying and afraid of heights. I will never go skydiving, even though it looks like a blast. I'd go into one of those wind tunnel ones. I would do that in a heartbeat because then I only fall 20 feet. I, I would love to go bungee jumping, but I'm afraid of the bungee breaking, you know, me and all that stuff, right? And, and the height thing as well because I don't know if I can handle that rush. It would scare the heck out of me. If I saw something that looked like a bunch of thread weaved in, I'd be like, mm, right? You see those glass bridges in China and Indonesia and all that stuff with the uh, people walking on it? You see how those people, and they're human, and they can tell that it's glass, and they freak out. They can't walk over the glass walkway. That's what your dog experiences. You see that? Yeah. So you see, the logic, all this stuff is really based on the explanation. Uh, it, it's that simple. But I'll get into that a bit more detailed on how to, it's hard to get the dog or your dog over it doesn't matter you know all of us have tried to stand on the great look we're fine come over here right it's a field of vision processing and a whole bunch of things there's a really simple trick that you can do to help your dog to get over it but it takes a little while to train your dog um just a bunch of things will happen it's not going to get every dog over the bridge but it's going to help a few people understand how to get the dog over the bridge uh, the other thing that i also talked about was um field of vision processing in that sense of Dogs don't blink. Dogs don't blink, correct? In the sense that they can stare at something without blinking for a long period of time. And you go, oh, you know, sometimes when I look at my dog, my dog blinks at me and they blink and they, right, and all that. And that's different. That's a cognitive and emotional process of what the dog is doing. But if a dog is staring at something, prey drive, they don't blink. Maybe if you disrupt their attention, they kind of look at you, they blink a bit, right? Because it's a cognitive process again. It's, it's a, that, this stuff is way further months down, episodes down before I get into that part because no one's going to understand what I'm talking about. And then I'll be like, mm, here we go back again to square one. Dog never blinks. So think of that in regards to field of pro, uh, processing, right? Uh, uh, processing field of vision. Just think about that scale of it, right? I talked about the other day about hackles raised the front hackles and the back hackles and how it's conscious and subconsciously rooted. And then when you see the hackles fully raised, it's the combination of conscious and subconscious. There's some trainers who have contacted me and said, yeah, I kind of thought about that. And mm, kind of curious because that's kind of an interesting thing because it does sort of make sense. Right. And it's like, yeah, do you see how simple it is? And they go, yeah, I'm trying to wrap my head around it. Can you tell me more? I'm like, no, you got to wait a little bit. You got to kind of follow through. The dogs don't blink because they're processing their field of vision. Abstract memory, I talk about that part as well, how the dogs process time and all that, and the slivers of frames that they see like in a slideshow projector, the old days slideshow projectors. The same thing regards to how dogs do this and why they don't blink. It's how they can tell prey, uh, squirrels prey in, in, a, in a whole host of trees with leaves moving everywhere, and how dogs can process that particular squirrel. It's redundant, it's rhetorical, it's anticipatory, all these parts of it, and it just makes simple sense. Super duper easy. I'm just saying academia is just, you guys out there gotta stop looking at dogs as just dumb animals. Um, you know, come from the apex predator behavior that we as humans have with dominion over everything in this earth. So we just gotta kind of step it back a bit. But yeah, dogs don't blink. Watch your dog when they're staring at something. If we keep our eyes open for a long period of time, we don't blink, right? We're just staring at it. And then we, when do we blink? When our eyes dry out, right? Because it hurts our eyes, so we blink. Dogs keep their eyes open even when their eyes dry out. They're aware that their eyes are drying out. So we're talking about regards to the way dogs process pain. You see, everything makes sense. It all makes sense. It all comes into the same aspect of it. Um, anyhow, so we'll go to that part. And the other thing too, watch your dog as well, because this kind of confirms the aspect of how dogs process field of vision. Think about this. Which eye does your dog look at? And the answer is both. You'll see that. Study your dog's eyes. Study the way your dog looks at you. Study the way your dog looks at another person. They're looking at both eyes at the same time. And that goes back to my 
theory or theorem in regards to how dogs process their field of vision, which makes everything else make sense in regards to redundancy, rhetoric, and anticipatory uh, um, um, uh, 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 vision uh, processing. And kind of uh, lost it. I just saw a fly go through, but I was like, oh, shoot, I hope it doesn't land on me. So that's it, right? Pretty simple. Um, okay, so I'm going to let you all go because it's an hour and 20 minutes, and I want to actually hang out with my, my doggies today and sit on the couch and watch one of my DVD movies. I don't have Netflix anymore. I found it when I was watching Netflix. I was like, you know what? I got 120 movies on Netflix. I got to watch 109 of them tonight. Otherwise, I'm just going to keep piling up the, the junk of movies and everything like that. So um, uh, now I have just DVD. I canceled my Netflix. I, just, I was just losing too much time. Like, oh, this is cool. Oh, this show, this show's good. This show's good. Oh, I haven't seen this movie. I was like, ah, oh, forget it. So now I'm on the DVDs. They're like five years old. I, I'm kind of like the little hermit dude. I got to get out. I got to get out and do stuff. I got to hang out with some human beings and everything like that. Uh, I haven't seen a movie in in months in the theater. I haven't seen a movie in my, and I hate going to the, hate going to the theater by myself to see a movie because it's always been a shared experience with uh, when, when, as I grew up, it's always been something that I, that because it was expensive when I was growing up as a kid. So it was something that I had to do with somebody because there was no use us going alone. If I went with my siblings, we'd go together as opposed to going by ourselves. Cause like, well, let's watch and share it together or with friends, right? You go with your friends in high school and all that. And we were, uh, grew up in a, in a poor family. So uh, these little experiences were just magical. So going to a movie, it's just absolutely gorgeous. I just haven't been to one. I haven't been out amongst the English in a while, um, you know, on, on a social side of things. So I want to kind of, you know, kind of reset myself with my dogs here and kind of get refocused on stuff. Um, I might start looking over my original uh, uh my not original my first videos and i might start writing some articles to kind of for those people who don't want to watch for an hour and a half of me rambling it's just going, you know james just get to the key points man and i might just kind of do a synopsis type of articles per per thing and then and link through everything as well so i might do that um yeah so just a a few things uh, that are going on so um yeah so regards to dogs blinking watch your dog you're going to see them not blinking when they're staring at stuff. See, look at which eye that they're looking at. They're looking at both eyes. Uh, when your dog is going over the bridge and all that stuff, it's their understanding of physics. That's per se. I mean, you know what I mean? Like, like they're not doing little doggy calculations on stuff. They just understand physics. If it doesn't look like it can hold my weight, it ain't going to hold my weight. If it's too thin, then they're going to know it hurts their paws, right? All this kind of stuff. When they're in the car and they're driving over the bridge uh, that you, they can't see because they can only see up to this point. They can't see the ground. And then if they do see the ground, they're bigger dogs, then they see the speed of the ground. And so they understand they're in the car, et cetera. And then look over there and they can't see any of the relational aspect because the focus is different, right? So then their mind starts going, well, this doesn't make sense. Optical illusion, so to speak, for the dog. Field of processing, understanding of logic, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and then there's also ones too. Maybe I should talk about uh, some other time in regards to why does your dog stick their head out of the window and bark at everybody, right? You know, a lot of people probably have that idea. But yeah, so th this is an, uh, not a bad Monday. Only a bit of a rail that I went on. Um, talk about a few of the topics here. And in regards to not pushing your dog, let them just stay where they're at and just don't push the progress and just, you know, uh, if dog's three years of age, it's going to take them three months. One month for every year on average for their dysfunctions. And that one month that you, the human, the parent are doing with regards to practice and training has to be consistent, like a son of a gun consistent. You have to keep doing it and doing it and doing it and doing it every day and it gets boring and mundane. But to your dog, it's just like going for a walk. To your dog, it's like hanging out with you on the couch. Life is right. So you want to just ensure that your dog understands that, hey, you know, I feel safe. Mom and dad, I feel safe. Right? So, yeah. Okay, everybody, thank you so much. And if you have any other ideas or questions or whatever, go ahead. Uh, you can see in my post, uh, when you look in the, the description, you'll see I have other topics from beforehand that I haven't talked about. So I just keep them up here. And then when I start to go through all my 
uh, pre notes and then start making them to key notes, then I just delete everything else out. So there's previous topics that a lot of people will say, oh, I saw it, but now it's gone. So I just take it off and I save it for the next time. Um, and then maybe I'll get to it if I'm not um, railing against somebody again. Um, it's just, you know, the shot caller stuff is just gross in regards to being a professional. Like I said, if you're an owner, it, it's, it's understandable because you're not a professional. You're not getting paid $450 or $3,000 uh, for that. You're, you're doing what you can with what you've been taught to do. You know, um, every single dog and all that stuff I've worked with, right? Just a regular collar, fabric collar, that's it, nothing else. If they're a really big dog, then I have to use a, a stronger collar. Like a, 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 I have a leather collar that came with one of the dogs, uh, one of the Danes here. And so it has to, that I use, otherwise the other collars, he, he's just, the snap just comes right off. Even if it's a rated for 125 pound plus dog, you're dealing with a 150 pound plus dog that is full momentum. It just makes the, the, the collar just snaps right off. So there's that, so I, I do that. Um, yeah, uh, we, we gotta change the world for dogs, people. We've got to change the world for dogs. I've got the cure for the, the dog's behavioral issues. It works. Consistency, teaching everyone how to do it at home by themselves for free, teaching trainers and behaviorists how to make adjustments for they themselves. Because I'm not going to be able to reach every single person in the world because, I mean, you know, I get two, 300 views here and all that stuff. Uh, but those trainers and behaviorists that are working and consulting with me privately and all that stuff, they're going on to help their owners in different parts of their world and then they look like rock stars and they're telling their owners things about their dog's behavior they're not, they're like and they're saying to me yeah they're asking me like they've never heard about this either and then i then i said this is what you tell them why their dog is and this is what their dog's doing yada yada and they go tell them they go wow yeah i told i told them this thing and i said this is why that happens and they're like and they're like yeah that makes sense and then they're like Maybe that James guy is right. And then they start asking me and they say, hey, you know, I'm learning more stuff. And they're watching my vlogs and everything. I, and I know those trainers and behaviors, uh, good ones and the trolls now. Uh, I know that you guys are watching my vlogs and everything like that. Um, it's, which is bittersweet, right? Because, uh, uh, you know, I've received a lot of criticism and attacks and, and trolling and just brutal, brutal. Like I said, one, some of the trolls published the, the address of my ex-wife and my children, right, before a couple years ago um, but you know what hey at the end of the day we have to forgive to a point of course right depending on how egregious the uh, egregious yeah egregious the egregious ah, who knows? can't pronounce it uh, how, how bad the the, in, the, the attacks are uh, most of them are forgivable um, but when it comes to the health and safety and, and dysfunctional healing of your dog I'm right there hundred percent right there and um, like I said I'm honored when people ask me to work with their dog it's you asking me to take care of your precious baby right which I would do you know take care of your dog and help you stabilize your dog um, yeah so uh, please subscribe to my YouTube channel if you've learned anything from here if you find anything that I say that's beneficial or you just like the fact of what I'm saying is helpful please subscribe to my YouTube channel. I'm at 455 subscribers now. Um, I'm trying to get to 1,000, uh, just so it's a nice number too, but I'm trying to get to 1,000. Uh, please share my posts. If you know anybody who could uh, benefit from just my, my stuff that I'm talking about, please share that as well. I really appreciate this incredible, um, you know, uh, honor to be able to share the stuff that I've done and leaving my digital legacy. So, you know, 50 years, 100 years from now, uh, we'll, we'll see. And I just want to say, I told you so. All right, guys, thank you so much. Have an amazing um, Monday. Enjoy the wet rain. Bye-bye.